Good morning. Thanks, everyone. My name is Sarah Donovan. I'm a labor policy analyst at the Congressional Research Service. We're part of the Library of Congress. And I'm delighted to welcome you to this first panel titled, What Do We Know About the Extent and Structure of Non-Standard Work? As was mentioned earlier, this is the panel that sets the foundation for all the discussions that will follow. So before we talk about the, pol the policies that are needed for workers in these positions, we need to ask, who are they? What are the different categories of workers that fall under the umbrella of non-standard work? Why are they in these jobs? What do they need? What do they want? So that'll be the focus of our panel. I'd like to briefly introduce our panel members, but you have their full bios in the packet that you received when you came in today. We'll start with um, Anne. Catherine, sorry. We'll start with Catherine Abraham, who is the director of the Maryland Center for Economics and Policy and professor of, of economics and survey methodology of the University of Maryland. Next will be Anne Palivka who is the um, research chief of the Employment and Research and Program Development Staff at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, followed by Doug Holtz-Egan, president of the American Action Forum. And closing will be Derek Amern, executive director for the Working Partnerships USA. So the presentation will be followed by a question and answer section. Um, on your table, you'll see these cards. Grab one now, and as the presentations are ongoing, please jot down your questions. When the question and answer session starts, someone will come around and collect your card. So put them in the air and they'll come and bring them to you. All right, and with that, I'll turn it over to Catherine. So um, thank you, I appreciate the opportunity to be here uh, to, to speak with you and also to hear what everyone has to say uh, throughout the day. I want to start by making one somewhat obvious but I think important point about non-standard work arrangements, which is that non-standard work arrangements are extremely heterogeneous. I think we all know what we think we have in mind when we talk about someone who's a regular employee. A regular employee is someone who's paid a wage and salary, who in most cases has an implicit understanding that their work arrangement is going to continue, who has a somewhat predictable work schedule, and who works for the firm that, that pays them. Non-standard work arrangements can differ in a number of ways from that standard arrangement. One important dimension along which non-standard work arrangements may differ is that rather than being paid a wage or salary, the person is, is self-employed. They might be an independent contractor, they might be a day laborer, they might be an on-demand or platform worker. So that's one important dimension of difference between standard and non-standard work arrangements. A second important dimension is the expectation that the relationship between the person and the entity that they're doing work for is going to be a continuing one. For people who are occasional contractors or day laborers or on-demand or platform workers, uh, work isn't expected to continue necessarily. A third important dimension along which work arrangements may differ concerns the predictability of their work schedules. Uh, we've had a, a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of interest in recent years in the issue of people who are uh, called in as needed and never know more than a day or two ahead of time what their work schedule is going to be. And then finally, there's the issue that David was just talking about, which is there may be people who work for one, are paid by one firm, but are actually doing work at the direction or under the standards set by some other firm. And that's another dimension along which work arrangements may prove to be non-standard. The topic that I wanted to talk a little bit about is what do we know about these various different types of non-standard work? Uh, where, do we have, where do we have data that we can turn to? Ordinarily, when we're interested in what's going on in the labor market, we look at data from surveys like the Current Population Survey or perhaps the American Community Survey. There's data in those surveys on the number of people who are self-employed, and to the extent that we're seeing growth in these non-standard work arrangements, we would expect to see self-employment growing. So that's one place we can work, look for data. 
More recently, there have been a, a number of, of household surveys that have been done to target specifically participation in informal work. There are the, the contingent work supplement to the current population survey, which was done several times between 1995 and 2005, and then repeated in a, in a somewhat different form by Katz and Kruger. Um, there also is information of potential value from surveys of employers, uh, private financial data, some of the work being done by people at, at, at Chase. I'm not going to talk about those data today, so I'm going to focus mainly on, on household surveys. So what do we know from these household surveys? Um, let me look, talk first about self-employment. One thing that's surprising is that given all of the anecdotal evidence about growth and the importance of these non-standard employment arrangements, if you look at household survey data on the share of workers who are self-employed, that's those various lines down at the bottom, different sources of household survey data, you don't see any growth in self-employment. That's really surprising. In some work that a set of collaborators and I have been doing, we've been able to take one of those sources of household survey data, let me back up. If you, if you look in contrast at data from, at tax data, um, people who are filing tax returns where they report Schedule C income, uh, issuances of 1099s, uh, data that the Census Bureau has on non-employer businesses, which is basically sole proprietorships, those have shown quite a lot of growth. So the two kinds of data are telling you really different stories. In some work that some collaborators and I have been doing, we've been able to take people who are in the current population survey, match up their records to tax records for those same people, and look at how what people are telling us in the household survey data compare to what we're seeing for those same people in the tax records. Um, I'm not going to talk in detail uh, about how we did that linkage and so on, but included a slide on it in case you're interested. It turns out that there's a lot of disagreement between what people tell you in household surveys and what shows up for them in their tax records. For this project, we're looking at all of the people who said they had self-employment income during a year, and then whether that showed up for them in their tax return for that year. And you can see that if you look at people who said that they had self-employment income in the current population survey, only about 55% of them had reported self-employment income on their taxes. The disagreement among the people who had self-employment income reported on their taxes only about a third of them said in the current population survey that they had self-employment income. So there's a lot of disagreement. For thinking about trends, what's relevant is how that's changed over time. What this is showing you, the bottom line is, you know, of the people who in the CPS, uh, who, excuse me, the people who had um, self-employment in the CPS, you know, how many of them didn't have it in the the tax data, that's not really changing. What's really changing is these people who report self-employment income on their taxes, but when you talk to them, they don't say they're self-employed. We're clearly missing a lot in the household survey data. We can say a little bit more about who those people are, and they fall into three categories. Some of them are people who just didn't report any employment at all in the CPS, but they have self-employment income. Some of them are people who had a wage and salary job in the CPS, but then it, they, they show up with a little extra income on the side that they didn't tell you about in the household survey data. That's people like many of us who may do a little consulting on the side, is, is part of that group. And then there's the people who, when you talk to them in the CPS, say, I have a wage and salary job, I work for this company, but when you go look at how they're paid, they're being paid as though they're self-employed. That's some of the people that David was, was talking about. And all of those people have grown. I guess the message I take away from that is that if we're really going to understand what's going on with these non-standard work arrangements, we need to develop surveys that do a better job of probing to get at what people are actually doing. There are, as I mentioned, a number of, of surveys that have been done uh, by the Federal Reserve Board, uh, by the Boston Fed in collaboration with the New York Fed, where they have gone out and surveyed people and asked them more probing questions to learn about informal work activities 
that they may be engaged in. Uh, they're focused on things like service activities, uh, selling items on eBay, uh, finding work through online platforms. Um, the surveys all show somewhat consistent results. I'm going to talk about the results from one of them, the survey of house, household economics and decision making. One thing that I think is interesting to ask is, how does the prevalence of this sort of activity vary by education level? Um, and it turns out that you see these activities at all education levels. If anything, there may be a little bit more common for people at higher education levels. Um, another thing that you might ask about is why it is that people are engaging in these informal activities. Uh, they listed a variety of possible reasons. It could be to make a little extra money on the side. It could be it's your primary source of income. It could be that it's just for fun, you're doing it as a hobby. I think, in some sense, the people that we would most worry about, potentially, are the people who are making a living doing this sort of work. And if you look at the data, it's actually a minority of people in these arrangements who are doing it as a, a primary source of income, though there's a lot more people who say that they're doing it primarily to make money. It's not, they're not doing, people are generally not doing this just for fun. A third thing that you might be interested in is how important the money from this, these activities is to household incomes for these individuals. And what this chart is showing is the uh, broken out by education, the people with high school or less, some college, a bachelor's degree or higher. Uh, the, oh, the dark part of the bar over to the left is the share of people who are saying that the income is very significant for their households somewhat significant, not at all significant, and, and does not apply, meaning um, mostly that they're just doing it for fun. For people who are less educated, it's more likely that this income is really important to their households. But it's, in every case, a minority of people who are, are saying that. So that's a little bit of insight into these informal work arrangements. I also want to say just a little bit about a different source of household survey data which is the contingent work supplement and the Katz and Kruger follow-up to the contingent work supplement. One important point to make about those data is that those, the survey that generated those data is asking only about people's primary jobs. So that if you, if you think that a lot of this independent contractor work, whatever, is work that people are doing to supplement a primary job rather than as their main activity, it's not going to be showing up in these data. But what can we get out of these data? I'm going to start by just looking at the data for 2016. Um, there's four types of arrangements that are being looked at here. Independent contractors, on-call workers, temporary help service workers, and contract firm employees. That's part of the group that David was talking about. Uh, and I've broken this out in this chart by the age of the people in the arrangements. Uh, independent contractor arrangements are arrangements that tend to be primarily people who are older, age 55 and older, much, are much more likely to be in those arrangements. And in, if you look at these by education, independent contractors and contract employees, firm employees, tend to be more educated, whereas on-call workers and temporary help service workers tend to be less educated. If we break it out by race and ethnicity, you see a similar pattern. African Americans and Hispanics are more likely to be um, uh, independent contractors, excuse me, Hispanics and whites are more likely to be independent contractors, somewhat the same pattern for contract firm employees. But on-call workers and temporary help service workers are more likely to be African Americans and Hispanics. I do want to say just a word about comparing the Katz and Kruger data to the earlier contingent work supplement data. Um, they, it was a, a, a big headline, 94% of the growth in employment since 2000, between 2005 and 2015 was in these alternative work arrangements. I think you have to take that with a little bit of a, 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 a grain of salt in the sense that 
the way that Katz and Kruger did their survey wasn't really comparable to the way that the contingent work supplement in the CPS was, was done. It was an online survey. People were only answering for themselves, not for other members of their household. Um, it's not clear that the sample was comparable to the, the contingent work supplement sample. If you look, the, the big headline number that was generated by comparing their data to the earlier data was looking at what happened to independent contractors. And they show, as David noted, a much higher number than the 2005 number. We have a little bit of other data that's trying to track the same thing. So there's something called the General Social Survey that over time has asked questions about these same arrangements. That's shown on the right. As you can see, you really don't, in a survey that's been done over time in a consistent fashion, you really don't get the same kind of pattern. So I think there's some uncertainty about how much growth in these arrangements we actually have seen. Um, the same thing goes for contract firm employment where the patterns in the two surveys are different. Um, I am out of time, so I will not talk about work scheduling except to say that I think that as we think about alternative work arrangements, it's also really important to think not just about the nature of the, the employment arrangement, who's paying you, how they're paying you, but what your control over your work schedules looks like. There are a significant number of people, something like 17% of workers in the US, according to one data source, who say that their hours vary based on their employer's needs. And there are an awful lot of those people, more than half, who get almost no notice of what their schedules are going to be. And I think that's an issue to be thinking about as well. Thank you. I too would like to say how excited I am to be here and I really hope to hear a lot of good suggestions throughout the day. And I'm also gonna build on what Catherine talked about a little bit, but also I have more slides than I'll probably be able to talk about, so I hope they're online. An overarching view to reiterate what Catherine says is there is a lot of variety in definitions of what makes up non-standard work. And a really important thing to consider when you're thinking about policies is that there is a lot of heterogeneity within the groups that are referred to, and even a lot of heterogeneity within the subgroups. And it's important to think about that when you're trying to figure out what questions you're answering. And on the outline of the talk, I'm going to discuss BLS data on non-standard work, um, data from the contingent worker supplement, and then data on worker schedules, two sort of aspects of that. And then I'm going to present statistics on preferences and some job characteristics, benefit coverage, um, and data from the BLS data. And then I'm going to conclude with some issues that I think you may want to consider when you're discussing these workers. As Catherine said, we have the Contingent Worker Supplement. This is a supplement to the current population survey, and its objective was to obtain information on workers in contingent jobs, which you haven't heard about yet, and then four alternative employment arrangements, those who are independent contractors, on-call workers, temporary help workers, and contract company workers. The most recent supplement was done in May 2017, and we're hoping to have the data out this spring. But similar supplements were done in 95, 97, 99, 2001, and 2005. And in 2017, we largely replicated the survey, but we did add some questions on what we call electronically intermediated work or platform work, think Uber or TaskRabbit. It is a household survey. We ask about all employed people. Um, except unpaid workers. We ask about people's main jobs, as Catherine said, but that might be the most important group to focus on in terms of benefits. Um, we collect a wide variety of information, demographics, earnings, preferences, health insurance, and pension coverage, and you can also hook this up with the basic CPS and the March income supplement. Oops. Okay, what is a contingent worker? A contingent worker are those who do not have an explicit or implicit contract for long-term employment. They are people who do not expect to continue in their job for um, personal reasons. Those people are excluded. This is a job that is structured to be short-term, and that's one aspect that we measure in the supplement. And then what kind of information do we collect to 
determine whether somebody is contingent. We ask them whether their job is temporary or not expected to continue. We ask them how long they expect to be able to hold their job, their main reason that they expect to be in their job short term, um, so that we can separate personal reasons from economic reasons, and how long the worker has held the job. Using this information, we constructed um, three definitions of contingent workers, and here I'm going to concentrate on the data in 2005 since the 2017 data isn't out yet. The first estimate, we look at just wage and salary workers who are expected to be, have their job, have been um, less than a year and expected to be less than a year for an economic reason. In 2005, about 1.8% of the labor force um, was in that contingent definition. Under our second estimate, we added in self-employed workers who expected to be and were self-employed for less than a year. Um, that was 2.3% of the employed. And then an estimate three for the wage and salary workers, we, re we relaxed the assumption that you had to expect to be and in your job less than a year and have been in it less than a year. And under that, you get um, about 4.1% of our labor force of those who were employed being contingent in 2005. And what I talk about subsequently, I'll be focusing on that third estimate. In terms of our alternative and employment arrangements, we have independent contractors, and those are all those who identify as independent contractors, consultants, or freelance workers in the supplement. We ask them these questions, and we identify them regardless of whether they identify themselves as self-employed or wage and salary. Another arrangement that we uh, measure in the contingent worker supplement is on-call workers, and those are persons who are called into work only when they are needed, although they can work on a schedule for several days or weeks in a row. Then we have a measure of temporary help agencies. Um, these are workers who are paid by a temporary help agency, whether or not they said their job was initially temporary. And then the final group of work we measure is workers provided by contract firms. And this is a little bit different than subcontracting. This is an intermediated work relationship where we ask, um, in addition to whether somebody works um, for a contract company, for us to classify them as a contract firm worker, they need to work on site of the customer and really usually only have one customer. Using those definition, um, in two, February 2005, 7.4% of the employed were independent contractors, 1.8% were on call, 0.9% were temporary help agencies, and 0.06% were workers provided by contract firms. Um, this is similar to the chart that Catherine showed, so you can sort of basically see the growth over time or non-growth over time, um, but it does not have the Katz and Kruger's estimates on it, but we obviously will be adding the 2017 estimates when we get them. Now I want to look a little bit about at people's preferences and job characteristics and benefit coverage of, a contract, of contingent workers. And here you'll see that the vast majority, actually, I can't really see, um, the vast majority would prefer to be a non-contingent, about 55.3%. Um, in terms of part-time and full-time status, you see that about, there is a major difference between those who are contingent and those who are non-contingent. Um, non-contingent workers, about 83% are full-time, whereas only about 60% of the contingent workers were full-time. In terms of insurance benefits, this is just for wage and salary workers, even though I said I was talking about definition three, you see that um, there is a discrepancy between non-contingent contingent workers in both having health insurance and having health insurance provided by their employers. Um, about Only about 52% 52, 52 of non-contingent workers had it provided by their employer. Um, whereas only about 18.1% of contingent workers did. In terms of pensions, you also see, perhaps not surprisingly, a big difference in pension coverage between both contingent and non-contingent workers. Now turning to those four alternative work arrangements, I think you'll see some stark differences, specifically as Catherine referred to, independent contractors, at least in 2005, were very happy to be independent contractors. 
Um, some of this might be because they're older, some of them, we actually ask them the reason for why they're independent contractors, and a lot of them, although I don't show it here, say they like being their own boss. In contrast, um, you see temporary help agencies, really do, workers really don't prefer to be in that arrangement, although about 32% actually still say they do. In terms of part-time um, work, um, on-call workers are part-time, almost a majority, 44%. Um, temp agencies, workers are not that um, disproportionately part-time. Um, and I shall should note that with the exception of temporary help agency workers, the majority of workers who are part-time say they would prefer to be part-time. Temporary help agency workers, um, a slightly higher proportion, although it's still not the majority, would say that they would prefer to be full-time. In terms of health insurance coverage, this is from any source. Um, you'll see that about 66% of on-call workers um, have health insurance from any source. 39% of temporary help agency workers, workers provided by contract firms in 2005, about 80% had health insurance from any source. Independent contractors, 69.4% had health insurance. Um, this compared to self-employed that are incorporated, about 85% of them had health insurance from any source and similarly for unincorporated. Some of that is probably related to age and that they're older. Um, and when you're looking at it, whether it's provided by the employer, which we, I don't have the self-employed or independent contractors here, you see that um, there is a discrepancy between um, those who are provided, say, by contract firms, whether they get it from their employer versus those who are in what I would call a more standard or traditional relationships. This is actually um, a chart of people's um, tenure. And what you will see here, somewhat surprisingly for some people, is that independent contractors tend to be longer term in um, their arrangement than, um, say, um, temporary help agency workers or on-call workers, which somewhat goes with their being older. Now I'd like to turn to the other aspect um, that we were referring to in terms of um, um, non-standardness and this is scheduling of work and here I'll cover two aspects, um, the control of work schedule and when people work. For control of work schedule, we have data from the National Longitudinal Survey, the CPS work schedule and work home supplement and the HUS leave and job flexibility module which has just been fielded. And then I'll also be covering when in the day people work, shift work, you know, think day, evening, night, or swing work. And that, there we have information from the CPS work schedule, the American time use, and the, and the module for the time use. The National Longitudinal Survey, most of you know, is a longitudinal survey, and it focuses on people, and the data that I will be giving is that people who were 26 to 32 in 2011 and 12 when the data was first collected, we are continuing to collect that data. And what you see here is that a lot of people really do not have a lot of advanced notice in terms of what their work schedules are. This is for hourly workers. And here you look at who has control over that, who's determined it, and you find out that a lot of it is being done by employers. Um, if you look at select groups, I think a group for whom this is particularly important is mothers or in fathers with young children, and you see that a lot of them do report fluctuation in their hours. A lot of them have a lot of less, less than one week of notice. And actually, if you really drill down more, some of them have less than one or two days worth of notice. You get similar information from the CPS work schedule. Um, and the American Time Use Survey, and I'm going to somewhat skip through some of this, um, just to sort of get to the notion that um, uh, what will be and was asked about in the American Time Use leave and job flexibility schedule is whether workers can vary their start and end time of their work, whether work have input into that start and end time, how far in advance they know their schedule, and then whether they are shift workers or not. Also, um, something that may be of interest is they're in part of this module is going to be whether they have access to um, paid and unpaid leave. 
So if I'd like to conclude, even though I'm out of time, that issues that I think you might want to consider when you're discussing non-standard work, as I noted, there is a lot of heterogeneity these in groups of workers. So it's important to think, what issue am I thinking about? And tailor my analysis to that group of workers. For instance, if you're concerned about minimum wage workers, you may want to exclude electronic platform workers and independent contractors who have a lot of control over their schedule. If you're interested in job security or portable benefits, you may really want to look at those short-term workers, the workers that are um, contingent workers or on-call workers, those sorts of things. If you're worried about um, earnings instability, um, you may want to look at the short duration jobs, independent contractors, temporary help workers, electronically intermediated work. Um, if you are interested in comparing wages, um, you may want to think about the new tax law because independent contractors may be being paid at a different wage than wage and salary. If you're concerned about work-life balance, particularly childcare, you may want to look at workers' control of schedules, um, how far in advance people know this, the interaction between whether you have control of your schedule and variability in your income and whether you are able to participate in sort of children benefits programs. I think it's important to um, not put different type of workers into a single category and recognize that there really is a lot of heterogeneity. I think it's really important to think about the terms in, that you're defining and try to avoid just putting all the workers into a great big lump and also assigning the latest label that one might have to that data. Thank you. So I want to say thank you to the National Academy for the chance to talk about this today, and I want to acknowledge at the outset the, the amount of work that my colleagues, Will Reinhardt and Ben Giddes, have done in this area and how much I've learned from that, some of which I'll, I'll tell you about today. Um, the, the explosion of platform-based uh, uh, commerce has been amazing, and uh, the very prevalence of the Airbnbs, Amazons, Ubers, Lyfts, Etsys, and, and a variety of things tells us they must be conferring enormous benefits somewhere in the economy. And what I want to spend a couple minutes talking about today is what are the benefits uh, of these kinds of approaches to organizing work? Uh, there's going to be a lot of discussion of the cost, but I think it's important to remember this didn't occur in a vacuum, and, and we ought to think about that as we think about the policy issues that they present us. And the benefits can accrue to um, consumers. Uh, and the benefits could accrue to, to the workers in those, uh, in those arrangements. So I want to talk a little bit about what little bit of research we, we have on those topics. It's all quite preliminary, uh, but it's important and I think somewhat suggestive. Um, uh, in, in terms of the benefits to consumers, I think one of the really uh, interesting papers was done by Bob Hahn and a variety of co-authors, Steve Levitt, um, Cohen, and others, that sort of looked at the Uber platform and tried to figure out uh, what would be the benefit to the consumers of that particular uh, access to that ride-sharing network? And, and they come up with an estimate of the consumer surplus uh, provided by Uber in a single year at $6.8 billion, and it, just an enormous improvement in their welfare from the access of the timing and, and other attributes of an Uber ride. Um, and that suggests we've got to think hard about um, uh, the consumer implications of what we might do to the work arrangements uh, as a matter of the, of the policies there. Uh, there's a, a second question as to sort of where in the distribution those benefits tend to accrue, and a couple of guys at NYU have looked at the get-around peer-sharing network uh, and, and concluded that an enormous fraction of the benefits of these kinds of things will accrue to below-median income individuals, and that, that this is actually most important lower in the income distribution and so in thinking about our policies again, uh, you really want to think hard about not just the, the efficiency effects, but also the distributional effects, and, and those are important considerations. It also suggests we need a lot more research in, in other areas to see if those kinds of benefits generalize. And there's some simple metrics of, of the benefits to consumers, which is if you look across the geography in the United States and elsewhere, where you see Uber penetration uh, rising, you see complaints about taxi service declining, the complaints about uh, uh, drivers on cell phones, uh, meters that don't work, dirty cabs, uh, the, the pressure of the competition produces consumer benefits, and, and that's an important consideration. So the, there's a, 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 a sort of nascent set of research out there looking at the, the product market implications, and I think that's something we would really need to build on and think hard about. 
Second set of uh, considerations really are the workers themselves. Are, they, are there circumstances where this is not something that's being posed, imposed to them so much as there's something that they might uh, benefit from in doing this? And so uh, Will and Ben and I, a couple of years ago, uh, got into the, the business everyone gets into, which is can we somehow replicate the contingent worker survey using something else and figure out the growth of the, the gig economy. And so we took the general social survey uh, from 2002 to 2014 and looked at three different definitions of what you might think of as gig economy workers, um, uh, acknowledging at the outset this is all pretty heroic. And, and what you see is um, really some benefits to workers and be able to manage essentially demand shocks to their ability to, to, find, to find work. That's a period that includes the Great Recession. And certainly, one of the, the things that jumps right out is that those people who are involved in the gig economy are more likely to have been laid off from, from some other kind of full-time work. Uh, they are more likely to be working part-time, trying to fill something in. Uh, as the economy strengthens, so if you look over that time period, uh, the growth rates slowed down dramatically because, in fact, as the, the sort of normal labor market firmed up, they, they made less use of the gig economy. And that the heterogeneity, and, and this is one of these panels where that word should just be thoroughly embedded into you, everything about these, these uh, workers is, has, displays a lot of heterogeneity. Another piece of it is geographic heterogeneity. If you look in the data, there's a very big difference in the use of, of gig economy workers across the economy. It was also a characteristic of this recovery that it was geographically quite uneven, and I think those are, those are something that, that sort of reinforce one another. So the sort of ability to manage uh, life in, in, uh, with demand shocks is one of the things that shows up. Uh, the second thing you might ask is, you know, are these, are, these, are these just workers, you know, drones, or are these entrepreneurs out there trying to um, uh, make a, 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 a living for themselves? And, my colleague, Will Reinhardt, did what everyone would do, which is he went to Reddit, which everyone would do, and then go to the urban, or Uber driver's subreddit, which of course you would do, and there you would find posted images of payments uh, so that you could figure out exactly what an Uber driver made for a particular uh, a trip, and you would collect a, a little over a year of, of images and try to calculate the earnings per hour of different Uber drivers, because that's what everyone does. And um, if you do that, you'll find out that the median uh, return per an hour of driving for those Uber drivers is about 37 bucks, but it varies from $2 to $470. And Will's take on this is not only is the data noisy, but also that the, the drivers have the capacity to bring to bear their skill to actually make dramatically different rates of return if they choose to do that and that they're displaying more than just the ability to navigate a car and obey the, the traffic signs. There's a, there's a business model underneath there that, that has to be respected and that you ought to think hard about. So this is an opportunity, this sort of uh, platform, for, for uh, using someone's entrepreneurial uh, skills and things. So the second piece of research uh, that looks at that, um, which Josh Angrist and some uh, con uh, colleagues did, which is to compare Uber drivers and taxi drivers. The Uber driver gets a fraction of the, the payment for the ride. The taxi driver pays, uh, typically pays a fee for the medallion, a fixed fee, and then gets to collect all of the fare. So you get different payment models. And as it turns out, you get people sorting into those different payment models on the basis of what their tastes are for their work. If you want to drive a lot, it makes sense to pay the fixed, for, fixed fee, become a taxi driver, and collect all of the fares and that's what you see in the data. If you want to just have a little bit of driving, shorter uh, hours, perhaps uh, a less regular work schedule, go be an Uber driver and collect the money that way. And so you're getting the benefits of the ability to sort in the labor market to match your preferences for, for the timing and the duration of your work in, in, that, in that example. And so those are things that I think are, are sort of interesting that there's not just um, uh, 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 sort of this notion that everyone's a, a clone, you get the sort of labor market benefits from these, these models as well. And so the, I think those are important things to remember and that, that we need to know a lot more about the characteristics of, of these, these platforms and uh, the, the consumers and the, and the workers that are in them. But in stepping back, I think there's, there's really uh, uh, two more things I'd like to emphasize. The first is there, there's a lot made of the use of algorithms to dispatch the work and that tends to have a character, the discussion of that tends to have the character being, is it good or bad? And I don't think that's the right way to think about it. 
There are algorithms dispatching work all through the economy, including some very large traditional businesses. And, and um, the question is, how well are the algorithms used? Are they top-down dictates coming from a management that don't suit the preferences of the workers very well? Or are they something where the workers are joining into an algorithm because it matches their preferences and, and, and you're getting something out that makes economic sense as, as a, a good match? And I think that's worth thinking a little bit more carefully about and, 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 and uh, um, uh, being cognizant that they're not all the same. And the, and the second thing is that the, basically what has gone on with these technologies is that it has reduced the cost of certain transactions. And you can do things that you could not previously do. And if you go back to the sort of simple Kosian notion of what is a firm, a firm's boundary occurs where it becomes cheaper to do something in an arm's length market transaction than to do it internally within the firm. And what these technologies have done is have changed the boundary of the firm. It is now much cheaper to do things across a platform and across a market transaction than, than it previously was. And it is unsurprising that the nature of our firms would change as a result. The issue is, however, if you're going to provide firm-based social insurance, the nature of your social insurance programs will probably likely have to change as well. And I think that's the, the, the task that faces us today and in the future. It's not a, a choice to roll back the clock. It is that we are in a different world with a different set of opportunities for transactions and different business models that will result as well. And it has always been a characteristic of the U.S. economy to embrace those new business models. You know, uh, David Wall mentioned uh, big box retail. Uh, people forget that in the great productivity boom of the 1990s, big box retail was half of it. That's, that was what was driving a lot of that uh, productivity. Those new business models have always been an advocate and so I come from Silicon Valley. Uh, I work for an organization called Working Partnerships USA. We were founded in the mid-90s uh, uh, when the tech sector was emerging as a force uh, and really uh, we are a community labor alliance that has come that came together to push back on the notion that the tech economy was working for everyone and uh, we have been found ourselves in this conversation about the future of work and the economy. And so I'm going to give you a flavor of some stories. And really, um, I think a lot of what I heard today resonated with what we're hearing, though I, can't, I don't have the stats always to back it up. I need a clicker. Thank you. All right. So we're... Um, and, uh, we often say in my world that Silicon Valley is a geography, it's a place. Um, we tend to define it as two counties in the Bay Area, Santa Clara and San Mateo County, although San Francisco wants to be a part of it now. Um, uh, it's also an industry, um, and it's also a brand, right? It's this idea that, you know, if you invent the new iPhone, the new widget, you can make it. You can be Mark Zuckerberg. Um, we're organizing low-wage workers and, and working people in Silicon Valley, and it's not all roses. Um, we would also say that uh, Silicon Valley is an epicenter of inequality. Um, one out of three workers uh, in the valley does not earn enough to survive. The housing crisis is officially an, a catastrophe, um, both because wages aren't high enough, but also because property rights and capitalism. Um, but, uh, and it means that you need $3,200 a month to, for an average two-bedroom apartment in San Jose. Uh, it means that a service worker earning less than $15 an hour has no chance at that. And what they tend to do is double or quadruple or triple, triple or quadruple up in housing. Um, I ran into uh, uh, an organizer the other day who said that when they were door knocking in East San Jose, they not only had an, a three bedroom apartment that was being rented by five different families with, you know, one bedroom will have the mom and the dad and two kids. They were renting for $80 a month the, floor, the space in between the floorboards and the dirt to an undocumented agricultural worker. Um, we're renting closets and, and garages, et cetera. And this is an important thing, I think, to think about when we think about the consequences of the fissured workplace um, and of the lack of leverage that workers have uh, with, industry, ind with the industries uh, like tech that are, in, that are making so much. More than one-third of school children are homeless in the Valley, and so we have workers like, like Nahima who... Um, 
was renting with her, she's a single mom, she's a food service worker at Intel. So she is one of these fissured workers who works in a multi-party um, uh, relationship. She works for a contract firm that then is employed at Intel, but she goes to Intel every day for work. And she rented with her two kids as a, a room uh, and finally had had it um, and moved to Modesto because she just couldn't figure out, she wanted to give her kids a better life and be able to rent an actual apartment. And now she commutes four hours a day, two hours in from the Modesto, which is in the Central Valley, um, and two hours back, and barely sees her kids, but insists that on the weekend it's better, right? So these are some of the things that, that these fissured workers um, are dealing with. We formed Silicon Valley Rising after the recession, the post-recession economy where we had just passed a minimum wage law in the city of San Jose, which at the time was one of the largest minimum wage increases in the country. It was uh, from eight to $10 an hour pre fight for 15. And yet workers were still making just $10 an hour and we were like, wow, in the shadow of the tech sector, we really need to be doing better than $10 an hour, right? Um, and so we've been, or we formed Silicon Valley Rising really to do three things. One, to organize these subcontracted workers in the valley. Our theory was that the tech sector could, could do different. It's a, it's a sector that has um, enormous potential uh, to do no evil and that wants to change the world, and that if we had leverage and workers and, and members, a base in the sector, that we could get them to do right by their contract workers and to really think about their contribution to the housing crisis and to help us raise minimum wages and do fair scheduling laws, et cetera. And we're succeeding. Um, we've organized over 5,000 food service workers, security officers, janitors, and shuttle bus drivers uh, in the tech sector. We have Facebook and Cisco are now union across the board, all of their subcontracted workers. We're in a whole different level of conversation with them about bargaining around a housing fund, for example, um, for their, their contract workers, or trying to build affordable housing on behalf of their contract workers. Um, that being said, we're also uh, still dealing with an economy that's not working for people, right? We have very few jobs projected in the uh, middle over the next 10 years, over the, a 10-year period. And most job growth is in the low-wage and the high-wage uh, economy. So for us, that means that we have to improve... This stat really did stick with us. There are 1.3 million low-wage workers earning less than $18 an hour in the Bay Area economy. Uh, there are only about 300,000 middle-wage job opportunities projected in the economy through 2024, about 30,000 a year, including retirement. Um, even if all 1.3 million workers got a PhD, there's no job for them. So we have to figure out, right, how, A, how are people making it now, and B, what are we gonna do to move folks into the middle? Con subcontracted industry growth is three times as large uh, as direct employment growth. So if we don't deal with leverage and figuring out how workers who, who aren't employed by Google, Apple, Facebook, and Amazon can get productivity gains from Google, Apple, Facebook, and Amazon, it's not gonna happen. Uh, and so this is an important thing that we think about when we think about how we're going to change both the economy but also deal with these, uh, imp the impacts and the real life situation of workers. Um, this fissured economy also, let's be clear, is racialized in terms of its disparate impacts. Uh, most, when, when we first saw some of the tech companies give their uh, diversity statistics, they were worse than we all predicted. I mean, 1%, 2% African American workers, directly hired workers, right? The exact opposite is true for the workers we're organizing. You know, the vast majority are workers of color. They're occupationally segregated into low wage industries, but they're also then economically segregated from the opportunity of those industries. Uh, and so, what else are we dealing with in the economy? Well, we, we know that when workers don't have leverage, don't have unions, and don't have a way to uh, voice at work, we're, we deal with a lot of wage theft, lack of labor standards enforcement, and crazy decision making on the part of contract firms. So Tracy Kelly was a um, shuttle bus driver for Google. He lived in Contra Costa County and uh, would get up at four in the morning and drive to San Francisco where he'd pick up his Google bus He'd drive around the city, uh, pick up tech workers, drive them down to Mountain View, and then he'd be off the clock and stuck, mind you, three counties away 
from his car, or two counties away from his car and his job. He'd be off the clock for four hours, not being paid, on one of these giant, you know, campuses where you can't really do much. And then he'd get back on the clock when he had to pick them up and take them back, and he'd get back home at like 8 o'clock at night, earning, again, just above minimum wage. Um, and so when you have this, this situation where workers don't have leverage, don't have power in the workplace, and are isolated from employers, they make these crazy decisions, right, um, for the reasons that we talked about earlier. In the context of this organizing, we often get asked, but what about Uber, Lyft, Airbnb, TaskRabbit? And what I would say is that some of what I heard today resonates, that we aren't, we still, the vast majority of workers we're dealing with are W-2 workers still. But when we start to dig deeper with them, so Tracy Kelly also drives with Lyft on the side. Um, Alejandro Mejia was part of our minimum wage campaigns and helped us win eight minimum wage laws in cities across the valley to get to 15 uh, by 19, faster than the state. I found out she drives for Lyft and that she found her childcare, um, she found, finds her childcare uh, on care.com. So folks are getting their income in different ways, right? Um, Nahima, who rents in Modesto now, also does Airbnb to earn some extra income. Uh, so I just think that one of the messages that we are thinking about as workers is, A, W-2 employment is critically important for us because we have leverage. We can organize. They have the right to collectively bargain if they're a W-2 employee. Um, B, they, all, most of our social insurance programs are still connected, right, to an, an eligible for workers' comp, et cetera, to W-2 employees. But we're, we're now looking at how do we contend with the rise of this type of work, not to be anti-innovation, anti as you say. I mean, the power as a worker organizer, the power to aggregate folks through an app and then be able to organize them is actually a really interesting idea. And I think some of us are starting to think about what the potential for that is. We don't know yet. Um, and so, uh, but I would, so I would say that some of our, um, what we are, are, to wrap up, what we're looking at is one, we're gonna continue to organize subcontracted workers. I think we'll get to 10,000. The vast majority that are left are the lowest wage women, immigrant food service workers, but I think we have a path to organize those workers. And then B, I think we have to do worker, I think we have to do experimentation in organizing, understanding that it's W-2 employment is still the gold standard because we can organize, because they have a voice at work. Um, but we really have to think differently. And so we're working with a set of partners in California to explore, uh, to start to outreach and talk to platform-based workers. And we're not assuming that we know what kind of benefits they would want or what kind, if, they, if you're talking about portable benefits. But we're starting to ask them, where do you get your source of, what's, what is your main job? I believe that a lot of these folks um, are doing this on the side and if we could figure out for, for many of them, instead of portable benefits or a new social insurance program, it's getting them access to existing benefits through their either W-2 employment, where they don't have health care, for example, um, that might be the answer. And so I, I just think um, that our message is we've got to keep organizing workers. Think about leverage and worker voice when you do policy making, because absent that, we don't think that you can sustain uh, policy change. So thank you. Um, so if you have a question written down on a question card, could you go ahead and please raise in the air? A staff person will come around and collect it for you and bring it up here. Um, but just to uh, kick off the questions, uh, during his opening remarks, David Weil talked about um, there being a bulk of workers who are labeled independent contractors for tax purposes, that's how they're hired, but yet they um, must respond to sort of a set of micro standards that are set by the company that hires them. And I was wondering, how well do um, our standard data sets um, and ones that maybe you're considering, how well do they capture the control the um, worker has over the work process? I know there's some information collected by BLS about scheduling, but um, are workers in the CWS maybe asked about how well they can control the work? Do you see there be sort of value in those types of questions? Good. Start out on that. A lot of, those are not things that are well captured in certainly the standard surveys um, 
or, or for that matter, in the contingent work supplement. I, I think the experience is that it's somewhat hard to ask workers about some of these things. So these people who are independent contractors, um, even though they're working at a place and, and doing work under the direction of that organization, in a fair number of cases, what the data suggests is that they report themselves as being employees of that mm -hmm. organization, and so you're just not seeing them in the data. Yeah. I think that's part of what the, the work that my colleagues and I are doing, trying to compare what people say in the household survey data to what shows up for them on their tax returns is, is telling you. Um, I, I, it is an area where you know, figuring out better ways to ask people about what they're doing and uh, how it all works is, is going to be really important if we want to develop a better understanding of this. But I also think that there's a lot of value to the kind of work that David Weil and others have done going into workplaces and doing case studies where you're you're getting richer kinds of information. I think that's going to be important too. Um, I, I basically agree. There have been some establishment surveys, but they weren't government funded um, in terms of who has control over work and that sort of thing. There is in Canada and some exploration about how dependent people are that are self-employed that are one customer. And I think this discrepancy really does get to about control over work and what it means to be self-employed. I mean, so substitute teachers get 1099 works. Do we consider them self-employed? Do we do they have control over their work? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the issues that I think we're thinking about. And um, it is something that's very hard to measure. Yeah. Okay, we've got some questions here. Um, so I wonder, Anne, uh, if you could talk about um, whether the BLS has plans right now and maybe has a budget to continue this work into the future? <laughs> okay, start with an easy one. Um, well, I, I think you're right. It all depends on the budget, and it all depends on funding. Um, and you, that's really... To, to be determined. To be determined. To be determined. <laughs> um, I mean, but there's certainly a desire, but yeah. there, it's a budget issue. Yeah. Um, Doug, we have a question for you. Um, could you say a bit more about the use of algorithms um, and what we know about how they're used um, to help and how they how they are sometimes challenging for workers? So, I, um, there there's just a lot of sort of now algorithm-based work scheduling, with, and uh, uh, some of it. Uh, for example, Walmart has recently announced that you know they they are going to take their algorithm-based work scheduling and make it match more closely the preferences of their employees. That that was a big initiative that was announced about a year ago, where, where they said you know th they were the kind of employer that would be captured as saying, look, you know, tomorrow we need you here, and that and that was turning out to be a real employee relations problem for them. And and so they've they're, they're still using an algorithm-based system. Employees put in the information and their preferences, and then they head off to, to do the scheduling. It's been, it, at Walmart's interesting because Walmart's actually quite um, uh, decentralized. Each Walmart gets managed by the, the, uh, the manager on site, and so that turned out to be a problem because there were a lot of uh, inequities across uh, Walmarts, and so the algorithm was meant to solve the inequities, and then it produced its own problems, and, and, and that's just, that's the nature of modern sort of uh, use of algorithms. And Uber algorithms are a very different thing. It's scheduling work as well. It's doing it on the basis of real-time demands by people for rides and by the preferences of the drivers for trying to get in there. And so I, I don't, I, what I get troubled by is discussions that say we've we got to get rid of these algorithms. That's, that's what's destroying the workplace. I, I think we need to be, to recognize that algorithms are here, they're here to stay, and we need to understand them better and use them, use them more wisely. So Derek, your um, organization has a really important role in you have face-to-face -face contact with these workers. Like you're, you are doing more than you know, filling out a survey, which is very, very important. Um, so you work in California, you work in the tech industry. Do you have um, collaborations with you know, sort of counterparts in other states and in other industries so that we're kind of building this rich information system across the country? There are some great organizers have, like doing work across the country. Um, uh, so yes. 
Um, Michelle Miller from coworker.org is doing fantastic work using an app-based platform to allow workers to work together and take collective action in the workplace. Um, many of the folks who've been working in the, con oh, the, the Workers' Defense Project in Austin, um, I'd say rock, uh, restaurant workers are really thinking a lot about algorithms and automation mm -hmm. in, in the workplace. Our, which was formerly our Walmart, is doing fantastic work in the Walmart sector. So yes, I think there's a set of worker organizers in the country that are thinking really deeply with workers about this problem. And what we have to do is get them in the room with you all as we do <laughs> policy making. Thanks. Um, well, that's all the time we have for questions. You please join me in thanking our wonderful panel and the work that they did. Please remember to fill out your evaluation. Just take a moment to fill that out. Um, we'll have a five minute break. We'll be returning here um, at 10.05. So um, please take a quick break and then we'll move on to panel two, the risks of workplace injury and non-standard work and policy options. Thanks very much. All right, thanks.